Mr. Feldstein, very good to have you with us. Thank you for making the time to very be nice with us. Very nice to be with you. Yeah, I know you are juggling between conferences, giving lectures, traveling all over countries and throughout the world, right? So what are you up to next? Uh, you're traveling again? Uh, yes, once again. I was in Seoul uh, last month, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going from here to the Middle East uh -huh. and then on to China before coming back to Washington. Oh, is that for conferences? Or what it's, were you doing in Korea, actually? Uh, I gave a speech, but I also mm -hmm. met with a number of officials, including mm -hmm. the uh, governor of the central bank and uh, and others it seemed to us that the u.s economy was on the verge of let's say recovery path last summer but it doesn't seem like it's showing any signs of recovery so how do you assess that situation the u.s economy is now very weak um, it's actually improved in the last few months the mm -hmm. third quarter of the year was stronger than earlier but it's still a very weak uh, recovery, not strong enough to really make a dent in the very high unemployment. What is the risk that the U.S. economy is facing right now? Well, I think there's a significant risk that the economy will slow down even further, mm -hmm. that the fourth quarter will be slower, and there's a risk that we will slide back into a, a new recession. So then, can you tell us what are some of the reasons that caused the shaky U.S. economy that we're in right now? Well, it all goes back to a downturn that started in 2007 because financial markets were betting on some things that turned out not to be true. There was a lot of investment based on mispricing of risk. Mm -hmm. um, the result was asset bubbles, high prices for everything from homes to bonds. Okay. And when that came to an end, um, the economy fell into a recession, and because it was not caused by high interest rates, there was no way for the Federal Reserve to just turn that around. And at the time, the United States Congress was also debating over a lot of issues, and they saw a lot of signs that will lead our U.S. economy into the current situation that we're in. What do you think was happening in the Congress? In Congress. Well, my sense time. is that the Obama administration really didn't do the things necessary mm -hmm. to strengthen this recovery, and it did a variety of things that went in the opposite direction that made the, the downturn uh, even worse. This particular summer, as you know, the United States Congress on both sides, House and the Senate, they were debating over the debt ceiling issue, whether to increase the debt limit, there were a lot of reasons why we shouldn't. There were a lot of reasons why we should. Can you tell us about how you view that particular discussion that went on this summer in Congress? Yes. I mean, basically, it's a debate about how big the government ought to be, what role the government ought to have. The Republicans were saying, we don't want more government spending. We want to send a message to the taxpayers and to the Congress that we have to put a limit on the continual increases in spending and increases in taxes. And that's what uh, had to be worked out before we could actually get the debt ceiling increased. And eventually they voted on the budget, uh, balanced budget agreement, correct? Uh, and well, it was a budget ceiling increase. Budget ceiling it's not increase. a balanced budget. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's far from a balanced budget. We have a long way to go, don't we? Very long way to yeah. go, yes. You know, during that debate, I think the uh, President Obama and his administration said they want to raise the taxes on the rich people. Right. Which would solve the problem. Well, no, it wouldn't Many solve the problem. Many of us don't believe that, No, it right? wouldn't solve the problem. It would yeah. raise some revenue, but mm -hmm. I think it would weaken the economy. And to the extent that it weakens the economy, it would hurt revenue raising, not just from the high income people, but from others, uh, small businesses, uh, ordinary workers who may lose their jobs or not get hired if the economy doesn't come back more strongly. Sure. Let me ask you a little bit about that. Uh, I know we talked about balanced budget amendment a little just briefly. The super committee was created after the Congress passed the balanced budget agreement, and which would initially cut about, what, $900 billion in spending? The super committee is charged with finding another trillion and a half dollars over the next 10 years. Now, remember that over the next 10 years, 
the national debt is projected to grow by nearly ten trillion dollars. So that trillion and a half doesn't even begin to make a big dent in the in the growth of the debt. What do you think about that? Can super committee come up with ways that the Congress can vote on? Well, I've talked with a number of members of the super committee. Uh -huh. They're working very hard. They're taking it very seriously. Mm -hmm. But the nature of the committee, six Republicans and six Democrats, means that you have to get strong bipartisan agreement before you go back to the Congress to right. try to get it approved. And I think that's going to be very hard. So I wouldn't say there's an even chance that that committee is going to come through with a, an acceptable plan. What happens if they don't come out with an acceptable plan? If they plan? don't come out with it, then there's an automatic set of cuts in both mm -hmm. domestic and defense programs. But they're not supposed to start until 2013. So there's time for Congress to then reconsider. And so mm -hmm. if I had to make a bet, I would say there's a pretty good chance that that's what will happen. We won't see a successful plan come out of the super committee. We will see this automatic um, sequester put in place limiting defense and non-defense spending. But then Congress will look at those numbers and say that's too painful. We've got to go back and solve the problem. And that may not happen until after the election next November. I want to ask you about the uh, Occupy Wall Street protests. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I don't understand it at all. Um, these are s yeah. small activist groups. Uh, we know the unions are encouraging it. Uh, they're providing uh, supplies and uh, transportation and things like that. But they don't have a program, so I think it'll just wither. And as the weather gets colder, it'll be less fun <laughs> to be out there protesting. And yet, for the time being, it seems like that Occupy Wall Street protest is spreading around the country. But you don't think it will I don't think it longer. amounts to anything, because there is no yeah. program. It's not mm -hmm. we need to uh, uh, spend money on this, or it's not an anti-war protest. Mm -hmm. It's just a general disgruntlement protest. And yet, some people still also equate that. Uh, Occupy Wall Street protests with what happened in the last election cycle when Tea Party movement became yeah, but very The Tea apparent. Party movement has a very specific program. They are mm -hmm. keen to limit government spending and to bring down taxes. So they're sending a clear message yes. to Congress. You could vote for people. They elected a number of, of people to the Congress. But there's nothing comparable to that happening uh, or the... potentially happening with this group. create more fairness. I want solidarity throughout the world. Occupy the world is about freedom from oppression. Get the greed out of Wall Street. I really want the government to really understand, most importantly, that life is more important than corporations. We want our freedom back. We need to get the power back to the people. I want less corporate theft. I want the American government to take the troops out of foreign nations worldwide. The government is broken. We need to fix it. I want to see the gap between rich and poor minimized. A chance to have the future that they dream about. Well, what are your thoughts on the uh, financial reform movement that's going around in the United States? Well, I think there was some need for financial reform. I think the, the Dodd-Frank bill that came out of that mm -hmm. is a very large, very complicated uh, piece of legislation and about to be made much more complicated by all of the rules, the regulations that will be needed to spell out mm -hmm. what Dodd-Frank is supposed to be about. So. Uh, to the extent that it focused on things like increasing the capital of the banks, which was really less a Dodd-Frank thing and more something that was agreed internationally, the Basel rules, mm -hmm. uh, I think that was a good thing to do. But I think there are many things in Dodd-Frank that are just not operational. 
You were appointed to serve on this organization called, please correct me if my uh, name is wrong here, Economic Recovery Advisory Board? That's right. Okay. Um, you pointed out in that, uh, that Obama administration is underestimating the risk of budget deficit in the United States. Can you elaborate more on that? Yes. Well, the budget deficits are, the projected deficits for the future are enormous. So even on the assumption that the economy returns to full employment, we're looking at fiscal deficits for the rest of the decade of about 5% of GDP and a debt to GDP ratio that could easily reach 100%. So that's, that's a serious risk to the economy and the proposals are really not dealing adequately with it. Wouldn't the deficit be further increased by the uh, health care reform that is strongly supported and pursued by the, this administration. Yes, well remember yeah. President Obama said about his health proposal that it wouldn't add a dime, wouldn't add 10 cents but to the national debt. That's but wrong. The re well, <laughs> the, the reason that it in some uh, sense doesn't is that it was coupled with a big tax increase yes. and also yes. with some uh, changes in uh, payments to doctors that have been proposed year after year but never actually take effect. So the plan itself, the spending side of the plan, will cost about a trillion dollars, uh, which in terms of GDP um, is, an, is even for our economy is a very big number. It's about 5% or more than 5% of of GDP. Some people predict that the uh, deficit uh, will have a negative impact in the future, obviously, because it will cause the, uh, the value of the U.S. dollar to fall and weaken our American influence in the, in the world, actually, right? So, well, I, know, I, wouldn't, yeah, I don't agree with that. Yeah. I think the dollar has been coming down. Uh, uh, that's important because we have a very large trade deficit. Korea has a trade surplus. Um, the U.S. has a trade and current account deficit of more than 3% of our GDP. That means we're dependent on the rest of the world mm -hmm. to buy our bonds and our stock to finance that trade deficit. So that can't go on and on and on. So we have to shrink that. And the key thing that is helping to shrink it has been a more competitive dollar. So I don't see anything wrong with the fact that the dollar had been overvalued and is now coming down. Uh, I don't think that it weakens our, our role Influence. in the global economy. Mm -hmm. I think the important thing is for us to not have to depend on. The thing that weakens us uh, internationally is having to depend upon other countries to finance sure. uh, our investment and our spending in this country. And you've been, for some time, you've been warning that U.S. economy is entering double-day recession. Has your opinion changed? Well, I've been warning that it could. I mean, I've been careful to say to people, don't quote me as saying we're in it mm -hmm. or that it's definitely going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the risk of it is still roughly 50-50. Um, as I said, the economy strengthened in the last few months. Mm -hmm. but that's history. And looking forward, I think some of the things that contributed to the strength in the last few months, like um, uh, improvements uh, in uh, government defense spending, are not going to be there, right. or uh, the decline in imports. There was a substantial decline in imports. Mm -hmm. uh, that was partly due to uh, the earthquake in Japan, so we couldn't import as many Japanese cars and other products. But that's not going to be there in the fourth quarter and the beginning of next year. So I think the economy will weaken. Uh, but I'm not predicting that it will go into a recession. I'm saying that there's about a 50-50 chance that that will happen. And to make matters worse, right now the Europe is also facing economic crisis, and that may further complicate the uh, status of the economy that we're in. Yes, of course, we trade with Europe. Our banks have relations with Europe. Uh, there's a psychological impact of worrying about what's happening there and wondering whether with our large deficits uh, that could happen here. So um, Europe is a serious problem, but our, our weak economy, our uh, recession, our slow recovery, all of that is homegrown, made here 
not imported from Europe. And how can we get out of that then, if it's all homegrown? <laughs> I think, uh, I'm an optimist about our ability to get out of it after the election. I think nothing happens before then. I think we're in a stalemate mm -hmm. until then. But I think changes in um, tax rules, uh, changes in uh, the long-term uh, entitlement mm -hmm. programs, some regulatory changes, all of those things will um, bring the economy around and bring us back to the kind of healthy growth that we had until the mid uh, middle of the last decade. Mm. You know, we have the upcoming G20 summit next month, and it seems like G20 is actually becoming a body or agency that is really trying to shape the uh, economic order. I don't think it's, it does. You don't think so? I don't think it does. I mean, when everybody agreed that every country had to go back and stimulate, well, mm -hmm. and it was easy to get together and write a communique saying we all agree on doing that. But now it's much harder to get that kind of agreement. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, it's a place where people can get together, maybe influence leaders, influence each other, uh, but it's not something where you can make detailed plans. You know, talking to you, uh, Professor, I feel like I'm in an economics class. <laughs> but I think our conversation is hopefully helping our viewers to understand the state of the economy that we're in. But I want to change uh, topic a little bit and show you some um, photos that we have uh, found. This is a picture of you with uh, President, President Bush, Bush. and I, be I believe uh, you were serving on his uh, advisory group, but was it a economic policy body? No, what I served on under President uh, Bush uh -huh. was the Foreign Intelligence Advisory okay. Board. So that uh, advised the President on issues having to do with um, the intelligence gathering by the U.S. government. Um, but the meeting that uh, that photo was taken at, I think, was um, a meeting in the White House talking about uh, economic questions. I see. And many of the economic advisors that served on the President Bush administration were actually your students, right? Former That's students? true, and it's uh, true also in the Obama administration. I see. Uh, Harvard students. Uh, yeah. I've been very fortunate mm -hmm. to have some very good students, and many of them go on to policy positions. Let's look at the second photo. Here's uh -huh. a photo of you with Chairman Bernanke. You were mm -hmm. named or actually mentioned as a potential candidate to succeed the next chairman, chairmanship of the Federal Reserve Board. Will you pursue that position if you were asked? Well, I think that's, uh, you know, right now Ben Bernanke is serving in that mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. He was the other uh, contender for that, the other potential, and the president uh, chose him. And he has many years to go in that position, so it's really not a live issue now. Mm. Let me ask you another way. Uh, do you think the Federal Reserve Board is actually living up to the name and its role that is tasked to do? Well, in some ways they're doing even more because this recession was so different from previous ones. The Fed couldn't just cut interest rates, uh, provide more money, and hope for the best. Uh, that works under a normal recession, but it certainly didn't work this time. The dysfunctional financial markets, the collapse of financial markets in 2008. So uh, I think they were very creative and really prevented the financial markets from staying frozen. We see another photo here. You yes. with uh, President Lee Myung Bak. When did you meet Korea's president first time? Uh, oh, maybe that was about two years ago. I'm mm -hmm. not quite sure. Mm -hmm. Korea is actually celebrating 60th anniversary of its uh -huh. economic, you know, growth. I'm very. Uh, positive and very optimistic about uh, South Korea. There's no question that it's had a remarkably strong economic growth during all of those years, mm -hmm. and it still has one of the best statistical profiles of any of the major industrial countries, and you now have to count Korea in that category. I think during the financial crisis of the late 90s, yes. and seeing how Korea recovered so quickly from it, it really surprised the world. Yes, because I thought that, in fact, I thought at the time, uh, and I spent some time in Korea at that time, I thought at the time that Korea was actually in better shape 
than the IMF was claiming, mm -hmm. and that the IMF policies were in many ways unnecessary and unnecessarily stringent. Uh, so in that sense, it wasn't so surprising that Korea could bounce back mm -hmm. after making those changes. And now that the long-awaited Korea-U.S. FTA has been ratified in mm -hmm. the United States Congress, I'm just hoping that the National Assembly will follow suit. And it would be very do, disappointing if they didn't. After if they all don't of this. do it, it will be yes, it will right. be a major disappointment, and they should. I mean, to continue our U.S.-Korea alliance, to continue our U.S.-Korea economic relations in all this respect, uh, that is very important. But if it is ratified and goes into full effect as early as hopefully January, what kind of changes do do you see happening in the? economies of both South well, Korea and the United it's States. It's not going to make a major uh, difference to either economy. It will increase mm -hmm. Korean exports to the U.S. and it will increase some U.S. exports uh, to Korea, but it's not going to have any really dramatic major, impact uh, on either economy. I see. You know, um, we have some viewers who would like to ask you questions, so let's listen to some of them and if you okay. can answer. Did your teaching method change after the economic crisis? Well, not the method of teaching, but the, the substance changed to some extent because um, these were new problems and students were interested in it and I've been very much involved in thinking about it uh, and so I wanted to change what I taught to reflect that. Second question. When will we see some hope in the global economic crisis? That's a tough question. Uh, I think for the United States, we're going to have to wait until after the election. Um, we may continue to expand, but at a slow rate. Um, Europe is really in trouble. I don't know when they're going to get their act together. But fortunately, Asia, in Korea, China, Singapore, Malaysia, others are doing quite well. Mm -hmm. And so we have a, a global economy which is not operating at the same speed everywhere. I have one last question for you. Um, what do you think... Uh what are some of the steps that we need to take in order to facilitate the economic recovery in the United States? Well, the kinds of things I am hoping uh, will happen after the election that will do that uh, include uh, tax changes. Uh, the U.S. has the highest corporate tax rate in the world. Uh, we have a very counterproductive system of taxing foreign investment. So I think that's one change. Personal tax rates have gotten high. I think we can raise revenue and uh, also at the same time lower marginal tax rates, provide stronger incentives. That's what happened under President Reagan, whom I served back in the 1980s, and we can learn from that experience. Uh, we have to fix the housing situation in this country. House prices are falling. That's hurting uh, consumers, therefore they're not spending, mm -hmm. therefore we're not getting the jobs that we need. So there are a lot of things that can be done and I think will get done once the election is behind us. It takes leadership to do everything that you just mentioned, but with the election coming up, I don't know if our policymakers and the leadership in Congress will be bold enough to say, let's do it even before. Mm, they're not. They're not. They're not. I think we will have to wait until after the election, and then there'll be an opportunity to sit down and work these things out. Great. Well, Mr. Felstein, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure You're very to welcome. have you on the program. Very welcome. Enjoyed talking with thank you. Thank you. The expert opinions on the global economic crisis are extremely diverse and divided. But one thing is clear, that we're all working towards improvement. And I hope that all of our efforts bear fruit and deliver us for a better future.